Hi everyone, welcome back to The Physical Educator. Today we're going to talk about classification of skill. The first part of topic five. Like we normally do, we're going to start with the assessment objectives and see what it is that you're being asked to do in this unit. It's a nice topic, skill. And 5.1 is looking at classification of skill. As you can see on the right hand side, there's only two of these points that require an objective three response meaning that most of them is a definition or outlining or differentiating between different types of skill or abilities. So let's explore this further. 5.1.1 is looking at the term skill itself and it can easily be defined as a consistent production of goal-oriented movements that are learned and specific to a task. Now consistent production is referring to practice, 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 and goal oriented is talking about either a forceful skill or a precise skill that you carry out to achieve a particular outcome. And that is the term skill itself. 5.1.2 is asking to describe the different types of skill. So we've got four different types of skill. Motor skills, perceptual skills, cognitive skills and perceptual motor skills. So first we're going to look at motor skills, movement with little thinking or perception required. So great examples, running, weightlifting, swimming, jumping, catching, hitting, loads of gross movements without any thinking behind the movement. But there is a wide spectrum of motor skills and we'll cover them in 5.1.3 and 5.1.4. Cognitive skills. Careful, thoughtful approach to a task, little movement required. So game intelligence, spatial awareness, recognizing patterns in play. As you can see with the bird's eye shot in football, they all move around the pitch in almost like a, a rectangle area. Skills can't really be seen, but they're inferred to exist based upon performance. And cognitive skills and motor skills help to make up many game performances. You do require both. Perceptual skills, a little bit different. You're judging what you can see and perceive. So a golfer from this bird's eye view, if he's in the bunker, the rough, the fairway or the green, the slope of the green, there's many things that need to be decided upon before a skill can be played. And lastly, perceptual motor skills, one that's very common in sport. You interpret the environment and then you follow it with a response, a movement response. And it's triggered by the positioning of your opponent or your teammate. And that's what triggers your movement response on how you've perceived the movement or how you've perceived an action of your opponent or teammate. Now we've learned the different types of skill, we're going to focus on the motor skills. And there's many motor skills for us to look at across five continua. And that is what takes us through 5.1.3 and 5.1.4. Now you've got to be careful here because the IB are asking for you to use contrasting sports because you could just use the same sport and I'll come to that with a few examples because it's dependent on the skill itself, not just the sport. But we're going to start with gross and fine movements and that's dependent on the size of the muscle that's recruited. A gross movement is using large muscle areas such as running, such as the examples I gave with the motor skills, whereas fine movements are using smaller muscles for a more precise outcome, such as archery or darts or anything with fine manipulation. And that's the difference between gross and fine skills. Remember, it's a continuer, so you can be anywhere along that line. I've given two examples of a strong gross skill and a strong fine skill. And this one is dependent on the size of the muscles that are recruited. The next one we're gonna look at is the environmental stability and it's open on one side of the continuum and closed on the other. Now, an open skill is performed in an unstable environment. There might be wind, there might be opponents, you don't really dictate the skill, it's an open skill. Whereas a closed skill, you decide it's a very stable environment, you can set yourself before you play the skill, and a golf shot is a fantastic example of a closed skill sport. You get time to really decide when you're ready to play your shot, you can choose your club, you can practice how you play that shot and you can try and mimic it identically how you've practiced on the driving range. And that's the environment stability between open and closed skills. Next, we're gonna look at the movement distinctiveness. 
That's the continuer and these three types of skill here. Discrete skills have a distinct start and end point, such as a tennis shot. Serial skills are a series of discrete skills in order. So a gymnast or a trampolinist is a great example here, or a long jump, high jump with a run and then a jump. And a continuous skill is performed on loop. Run, swim, cycle are all continuous skills performed on a loop. Not really clear where the start and the end of the, the movement is. It's just a continuous loop. Next is movement initiation. We've got internally paced skills on one side of the continuum and externally paced skills on the other. Internally paced means it's you, within you, you set the pace of the skill. And again, golf is a fantastic example of this. There's no time restraints. And if you've ever played golf with people who take forever taking a shot, it can be quite frustrating. But that's the game. You can take as long as you want to set yourself for your shot to make sure that you're ready to execute it in the way you want to do. Whereas externally paced skills, the time management of the skill is dependent on the scenario, unlike the performer for the internally paced skill. So here it's set by the game that you're in, more than likely. And your decision to execute your skill is based upon an object or a ball coming to you and you have to decide what to do quickly in returning the skill. Next, we have amount of interaction. And we have individual skills, which is just you as an individual performer. Now, this doesn't mean you're not in direct competition with somebody else, but you are performing your skill on your own. We also have coactive skills. So think about lanes with this. You're competing with somebody, but there's no confrontation. And lanes separating swimmers and sprinters is the best uh, example to give here. An interactive skill is as it sounds, you are interacting with your opponents usually on a court or a pitch, and you are coming in close contact with them, your decisions are made because of their close contact, and your skills are decided because of this close contact. Now we've looked at skill, we need to look at ability. So 5.1.5 is asking us to outline ability and what it is. Now ability is a general trait or capacity to carry out a skill that's linked to a performance. So the main difference between ability and skill is the fact that skill is something that is learned through consistent production, it can be improved. Ability can't really be improved, it's genetically determined from birth. And we've all probably played with people before, or we are people luckily, who can pick skills up quite quickly, can pick up new sports. And that's because we have an ability to perform a skill. And we need to make sure we understand the difference between these two terms within this unit. And next, 5.1.6 wants us to differentiate between Fleischmann's physical proficiency abilities and perceptual motor abilities. Edwin Fleischmann was an American psychologist and he was known for his work with the physical proficiency abilities and perceptual motor abilities. Now we've pretty much looked at this already, but we have to be specific for 5.1.6 at talking about the difference between physical proficiency and perceptual motor abilities. Now, physical proficiency refers to gross movements and using large muscle groups, whereas perceptual motor abilities refers to a combination of how we sense the environment, how we perceive it, and how we act. Motor control, using a motor skill, and how these two things work together. You don't need to recite some examples but obviously you need to look at examples to understand it further. You don't necessarily need these for your exam, but like I said, they'll help you to understand it. Physical proficiency, some examples, dynamic strength, flexibility, explosive strength, static strength, trunk strength. None of them require you to perceive a situation. It's just your physical ability in them areas. Whereas perceptual motor abilities are talking about controlling and precise movements coordination between different limbs, reaction time, how fast you can react, and then how fast you can respond, and also the speed of your arm movement. So you can have strength in your arms, but how fast are your arms moving, and are you perceiving the speed of your arm relative to the scenario you are placed in? So what this is saying is physical proficiency is using your gross motor skills, perceptual motor abilities are looking at combining motor skills with how you perceive the scenario you are placed within. And that is the difference between the physical proficiency abilities and the perceptual motor abilities. Next, we need to look at the term technique. Now, technique is different from skill and ability. 
and technique is the way in which a skill is performed. Now we've played sport before, we've watched sport before and we know that in the sport of your choice you know how strong a technique is. You can watch somebody and go wow look at that technique or that technique needs improving and you're able to do that because you understand the teaching points behind the skill itself. You, be, you know the teaching points behind the technique that makes up the skill and that's the concept of technique and it's very different from ability and skill. Although skill, ability and technique are different, they are related and they are linked together. And the way they are linked together is to achieve the skill itself. Now a successful production of a skill is dependent on somebody's ability and their selection of appropriate technique. So to make it simple, maybe on a multiple choice question, ability plus technique equals skill. And that's the relationship between the three terms. And lastly, 5.1.9 wants us to discuss the difference between a skilled performer and a novice performer. So this is quite obvious, a skilled performer and novice performer. What I'm going to take you through is what it says in the specification, which is the key points for you to look at. If you want to learn more about the difference between a skilled performer and novice performer and you want to watch something on YouTube, I advise the Cristiano Ronaldo documentary from about 10 years ago. He goes up against someone called Ronald. It's a great documentary. It really shows the insight of an elite athlete compared to a average Joe. And there's many, many differences, not just with what you see in the skills. There's many things behind the scenes that you don't realize. A skilled performer is excelling compared to a novice performer. So like I said, we're gonna look at the main points for this specification and accuracy is the first one. So a skilled performer has a pinpoint accuracy. It's very high. Whereas a novice performer is capable of producing the same accuracy as a skilled performer, but it's very sporadic. And as we come to in a second, it won't be as many times, it won't be as consistent as the skilled performer. And consistency is very high within a skilled performer. It, and what we mean by consistency is repeated accuracy, repeated control, repeated fluency. And that is very high. They can hit that high level time after time after time. Whereas a novice performer, like I've already said, is capable of doing it, but very randomly. Not with accuracy, not with consistency. So they're a low consistency for a novice performer. Next, we've got control. Again, no surprises, skill performer very high. It allows for accuracy and consistency. So the two we've already spoke about, control and precision are the two reasons that allow for accuracy and consistency. So obviously the novice performer has low control or again, ineffective control overall, which lowers the consistency and accuracy of the performer. Efficiency, obviously a skilled performer has high efficiency, but what's important here isn't just by saying, oh, it's high as well, that's high as well. What makes an efficient performer? Well, they're efficient with the technique and the selection of the skills, and the better the performer, they preserve energy. You might have watched skilled elite performers play, and you might say, oh, it looks like they're just gliding. Roger Federer, when he plays tennis, never looks out of breath. He never looks like he's sprinting or scrambling from one side of the court to keep the ball alive. And that's because he's efficient with his technique, he's efficient with his tactical play, knows exactly where to be. Although you'd expect that from all elite tennis players, nobody does it quite like Roger Federer, hence the reason he's arguably the best tennis player ever. And it looks like he just wanders around the court at one mile an hour and nobody can beat him. And it's because of how efficient he is with his technique and his tactics. A novice performer obviously has a low efficiency, inaccurate technique, poor skill selection, uses up energy, so therefore later on in the performance, the consistency, the accuracy, the control will all go down because they're losing energy. You can't concentrate or focus on them skills like they could do at the start of the performance. Fluency, so this is about how smooth you can do the skill. So obviously a skilled performer is very smooth. They're able to seamlessly link skills in a performance pattern. So I'm thinking a golfer here, there's a thousand things for them to think about. And when you watch them at full speed, it just looks like one skill straight performed. Whereas a novice performer with lower ability and lack of training, 
They'll be very erratic with their skill. They might be capable of knocking one down the middle of the fairway, just like Tiger Woods. But then if you ask them to do it again, it might end up in the trees. So the fluency of the skill and linking together the subroutines within the skill, it's very difficult for a novice performer. Goal-directed skills is something, once again, that is very different between a skilled performer and a novice performer. But why? A novice performer will just try and perform the skill that they know. You know, they might not have any goals. If they do, they'll be short-term. And the selection and performance of the skill is the same despite the scenario. Where a skilled performer chooses skills based on the scenario as opposed to a novice performer who will use their best skills, if you like, in a scenario, even if it's not the right skill to choose because they know they can do it, they'll, they'll choose it. I'm thinking professional soccer here and football. If you watch it on the TV and you see the tactics behind it, same with basketball, the tactics behind it at the top level, they can all do a range of skills, but they're choosing the right skill for that right moment in that right play to try and achieve the, the outcome, the goal-directed outcome. It could be a tactical choice. It could be an actual skill itself. It could be because someone's defending very well, they might need to use a different skill to overcome their opponent as opposed to just use their favourite skill and the skill that they can do the best. And there's a big difference here between how a skilled performer approaches a match or a game compared to a novice performer. And then we've also got learned skills. Well, skilled performers can learn new skills very, very quickly. And if you follow any of the NBA on Twitter or on Instagram, you'll see videos of the likes of James Harden and LeBron James being taught a skill, quite an advanced skill, a bit of a handle skill, just ready to shoot at the basket. And they get shown this skill once and they can do it straight away. And not only can they do it straight away, they can probably do it better than the person who showed it them. They can pick up new skills unbelievably high, but they can also pick up a difficulty of skill. So you can give them more than one skill and they'll be able to throw it into their autonomous skill set pretty immediately without much thought because their ability is at that level for them to take them skills on. A novice performer still performs cognitively. They're still thinking about the technique of the skill. And the problem is, when you think about the skill, you're more likely to get the skill wrong. That's why you need to practice, try and put it into your long-term memory. And then when it comes to doing the skill, you should be on auto drive and muscle memory to perform the skill. And a novice performer isn't at that stage. So they can't learn as quickly as a skilled performer can. Thanks for watching. If you're a teacher looking for teaching resources, don't forget to check out the Physical Educator TES channel and you can pick up resources there for all units, including a detailed PowerPoint on skill in sport. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I hope to see you again soon.